Happy Wednesday. So tonight, we have Claire Golnick, and she's the Director of Data Science at NS1, an industry-leading DNS and traffic management platform. She writes and speaks often on the intersection of data, philosophy, and entrepreneurship. Claire was previously CTO of Terbium Labs and originally trained as a neuroscientist. So please welcome Claire. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, so you just heard a little bit about me. So before I get started, I want to take a quick poll to figure out who we have in the audience uh, today. So by a sh show of hands, how many people here are product managers or product people? Okay. Uh, designers, UI, UX. Uh, data scientists, some of those. Um, engineers. Anything else important that I missed? Media. Marketing, media, okay. So a range of backgrounds. Um, uh, as Kim just mentioned, uh, I started my career as a scientist, um, but I have spent most of it um, in tech and developing data products. Um, and most of my career has spent in, in, as I worked in startups, and so I worked in data products that were very young um, and did not yet have product market fit and didn't have a lot of resonance in the market. And so I've spent a lot of time thinking about what it takes to make a data product that actually sells. Uh, in today's talk, um, I'm doing something a little different than what I normally do. Normally in a talk, I try to tell you something new, show you a new project or show you a new idea. Um, today, I'm actually gonna talk about fundamentals, something that anyone who's in this room probably knows or basically knows by the nature of the fact that you came out to hear a talk on presenting data on a Wednesday evening. But even though it is very much fundamental and I'm not sure that I'm gonna tell you something that you don't know, I believe what I can offer is a little more insight into why these things you know to be true are true. And when you really fundamentally understand why they're true, you might be less tempted to try to forget them and actually use them in your execution. So, um, so today we're talking about why no one's looking at your data and thoughts on designing data dashboards and data products. And the most important thing I want you to take away from this talk, this thing that you probably already know, is that data does not speak for itself. As much as we wish that it could, as much as we wish that we would, as much as people who sell machine learning and AI products might try to pretend that it does, it is actually very, very hard to make sense of data. And when you don't recognize that, what can happen is you can end up with very, very mismatched expectations between what is promised in a data product and what is actually delivered. And this is something I have experienced in particular with early MVP products and selling them often over and over and over again. And when this happens to me, I am reminded of this scene from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Have you guys, who raised your hand if you've heard of the, or read the books or watched the movies? Okay, so you probably know where I'm going with this very quickly, but in case you haven't, the lean up to this scene is that um, some, it's a sci-fi novel, so some alien species has built a supercomputer um, that they believe can answer the meaning of life. Uh, life, the universe, and everything. And they're about to find out what that answer is. And this is uh, what the computer says. Yes, but you're not going to write it. It doesn't matter. We must know it. All right. The answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is forty-two. Yes, yes, I thought it over quite thoroughly. It is, it's forty-two. It would have been simpler, of course, to have known what the actual question was. But it was the question. It was the question.
was the question. I, I have seen that look of disappointment <laughs> when someone expects something truly magical and they expect something to have a lot of meaning, but it just doesn't make sense to them. They just don't know what to do with it. Um, so, surprise, I actually don't know the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Um, and I don't know how to make sense of 42 in that context, but 42 is as good of number to start with, or a good of random piece of data to start with for talk about how you actually do derive uh, meaning from data. So I'm gonna use this as an example, not intending to end up with the solution to all things. So let's assume we have a piece of data and it's 42. How do you actually make meaning from this data? Well, a very obvious first step is to add units. So here, we now have 42 kilograms. Kilogram is a SI unit of mass, um, an international standard, and someone, in fact, an international governing group, has decided what the definition of a kilogram is. Um, the kilogram is uh, interesting as far as SI units go because most units are derived relative to some natural phenomenon. So for example, a calorie is the amount of heat it takes to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. And that's how we define, for example, how much energy is in our food. The kilogram is a controversial standard unit because instead of being relative to something natural, it's actually defined relative to a random piece of metal. Um, I think it might be made out of platinum and something else. And the platinum, uh, this random piece of metal actually does live in a series of bell jars, like you can see uh, here in the pictures, and is locked in a vault outside of Paris. And that is the definition of a kilogram. And we have agreed upon that, and that is how everyone knows what a kilogram is. Sort of. Because chances are none of you have actually seen that random piece of metal. Instead, you've developed a concept of what a kilogram might mean by having shared experiences with other things labeled as a kilogram throughout your life. So, for example, if you spend a lot of time in the gym, you might have some concept. When I said 42 kilograms, that might have meant something to you, like some specific exercise you might be able to do within that weight range. Like, I don't actually know. Maybe that's like something you can do with a deadlift or something like that. Um, or if you're like me, you don't actually have a very good intuitive understanding of what a kilogram is. So in order for you to understand what 42 kilograms was, you had to pull out that little fact in your brain that says one kilogram is 2.2 pounds and immediately do that math so you could have any standard of reference at all. A little over 90 pounds. So now that I say 90 pounds, we might all have this, this shared understanding and reference of what <laughs> amount of weight or what amount of mass 42 kilograms is. But it's also really easy to break this shared understanding. You don't have to do much to a piece of data to break this nice shared understanding that we all have. What if I told you that we now have a 42 kilogram cat? I'll give you a second to think it through. <laughs> so I don't know what went on in your brain, but I'll tell you what went on in my brain when I tried to conceptualize a 42 kilogram cat. The first thing I did is I thought of a cat. Um, my friends have cats. I'm a dog person, but I've seen cats. Um, and I, I thought of this cat, and I thought, huh, like how big do I think a cat is? I don't think in kilograms, so I'm like maybe like 12 pounds, something like that. And I will do that mental math. What is that in kilograms? Oh, wait, we are, something is very, very wrong here. This is clearly not what I was thinking. This is not a house cat. The only explanation for this is that we have reached some sort of big cat status. So this is not a cat that I would see uh, in my friend's house, which is what I originally thought of, but instead um, something that I would see probably in a zoo, or if someday I get really lucky and I go on a safari, I might be able to see one in the wild. Um, so I can do that mental logic and that shared reference of what it is that I think a cat is, but I can only get so far. And even on this very, very, very simple example, something becomes apparent on, um, when you think about what we've been able to do with this single piece of data, is we've actually segmented the market or segmented the audience into experts and non-experts. What do I mean by that? Chances are someone in this audience 
is an expert on big cats. So when they saw a 42 kilogram cat, they were able to make a different set of inferences and guesses than I was able to make. And all of that has to do with our frame of reference and what you're able to compare it to, what you already know. What do I mean by what you already know? Well, I'm gonna map it out exactly what I've already told you. This was my own personal mental model of a cat. It's not particularly complex. Um, first, I did it in pounds because, again, no intuitive understanding of kilograms. Always have to do that conversion. Um, I mapped out this guess of what I thought the weights were of domestic cats and big cats before I did any research for this presentation. So you're seeing my real actual guesses. Um, and so I had these two models of cats. I had domestic cats and I had big cats. And then I got my piece of data, my 42 kilogram cat, and I can put it on this graph. And I will show you that this matches none of my understandings of what makes a big cat. In fact, I believed that this does not describe a cat at all. Um, in fact, this caused me to actually Google what is the largest domestic cat that's ever existed, just because I needed to know at this point. Is it possible that you could have a 90 pound domestic cat? In case you're wondering, the answer is no. <laughs> Um, the largest cat on record was 41 pounds, which would have been great if it was 42, because that would have made a really nice story, but it wasn't. Um, but basically, I stopped with, my, with this piece of data, a 42 kilogram cat, I was able to stop at just the knowledge that this is probably a big cat, but I don't really know which ones. If I had been an expert, and now that I've done a little bit of research, I'm a little better, I might have had a more complex mental model of what makes a cat. I might have, for example, been able to name the different species that make up a big cat. And I might have had some intuition or knowledge about their relative sizes and weights. Um, so for example, I might have learned, an expert might know that tigers can range dramatically in size, but also are some of the biggest cats that exist. Lions tend to be very, very large, uh, but don't, don't vary as much as tigers do. But most importantly, that there is a good number of big cats that fit solidly in this 42 kilogram cat range. And so that means what an expert would be able to do with a single piece of data is probably tell you what species is most likely true, or what this, that this cat is most likely from, given no other information other than the weight. But because they can make a pretty solid guess about what species it's from, and they're experts, they can probably do more than that. They can probably tell you where this cat probably lives, what it probably eats, um, maybe how fast it could run, which could be really important depending on what you're using this inference for. Um, and so experts, now an expert, someone who has a really good and solid understanding of all of the differences in big cats, and now has a way more knowledge than I, given the same data, was able to figure out. Summary statistics, or raw data, is not an equal opportunity informer. It depends where you start. Experts can use data more effectively than non-experts and reach the same definition or some threshold in which something is actionable. So for the sake of uh, this presentation, let's pretend an actionable insight is being able to guess the species of the big cat. Given a single piece of data, the expert is crosses that threshold and catapults into another stratosphere of other questions and other types of issues that they might want to know about this cat. Like they don't need to know, you know, how big are lions because they already know, they've eliminated that as a possibility. They're asking totally different questions. Meanwhile, non-experts haven't even reached the minimum necessary information to change their form of action. This dynamic, where when you present raw data or just simple summary statistics, creating a segmentation of your customers or your market into experts and non-experts is a really, really common dynamic. And it creates a lot of problems for people trying to design a product. Because the way that you design a product and your goal with a product is to have a product that delivers repeatable and scalable value, consistent outcomes across your entire target market. And when you have wildly divergent outcomes in different customers, depending on what they already know, it's very hard to create that process. 
So what do you do? I think of this problem as sort of a moving targets situation. You have two perfectly valid targets or potentially target audiences for your product. You have experts and non-experts. But for every piece of data you give them, they move farther and farther apart from each other on what their next issues or next biggest problems are. And what can be tempting um, to do is end up somewhere in the middle. But that's like throwing a dart halfway in between two dartboards. You are pleasing no one and getting nowhere. What do I mean you can end up partway in the middle? What do experts sound like when you've given them a tiny bit of information? Oh, that's so cool. I'm so excited. What is the next thing that I'm, what are you going to do? Well, you could have looked at the data this way. Well, if you'd done it this way, then I would have seen the problem this way. Actually, maybe, can you just give me the raw data? Because that's what I would have preferred to have anyways. And that's true, because the truth is experts are going to work magic, potentially, with raw data. What are you hearing from the non-experts? Mostly nothing. They're not answering your phone calls. They're not having much commentary in your customer meetings. You have just given them something that they, maybe it's interesting, but they don't really know what to do with, right? What action can I actually take? You haven't actually met the basic need yet, and so you don't have a viable product at all. And the question is, what happens when you, what does it look like when you end up in this middle ground and you try to sort of reach these, uh, non-experts who are trying to do the very most basic functionality and also satisfy these experts, <laughs> you end up with what I call a classic knock or sock uh, dashboard wall. A wall of dashboards <coughs> displaying a ton of data that no one ever looks at. And they don't look at it because it's not useful to any individual person. It's just a nice to have in theory. But Experts are always going to go find that data at the source, and you haven't provided enough context for anyone who's not an expert to actually interpret any of the information on a dashboard. And this is one of my hypotheses, or my, my market hypothesis, for why dashboards so often fail as products. What do you do instead? You can choose to empower non-experts to make great inferences, by making a direct comparison to the correct mental model, the one they would have needed to make a great inference. Before I go much farther, this is the point where I'm going to talk about the very fundamentals of what do I mean when I say make a great inference. Inference, broadly, is the process one uses to make data actionable. It is the process. It's tied up very closely with the concept of inductive logic. Um, and it's also the process that we use to create knowledge. An important thing that you need to know about the process of inference is that it always involves making a comparison to existing knowledge. There is no such thing as getting something from nothing. You always have to make a comparison. And this sounds like a very simple thing, but it's actually really hard to act on on a day-to-day -day life. Um, so I'm about to go way more technical for a very short period of time. And the reason I'm doing it is to try to brush through an argument that there is no new technology that's coming out, there is no new algorithm, there is no new ma machine learning uh, approach that is changing this fundamental truth that inference requires a comparison to existing knowledge. And I'm going to do that with a whirlwind pass through science, statistics, and philosophy in about five to six minutes. So are you ready for this? Inference requires a comparison to an existing model or belief. And you know this because you know what it means to design an experiment. The scientific method starts with first having a clear hypothesis and then designing an experiment to test that hypothesis. But more than that, the best experimental design that you can design is what they call a randomized control experiment in which you take a set um, of subjects, in this case we'll pretend um, this is a, a test for a treatment of a drug, and randomly assign them into a control and an experimental group. You run your experiment, one of which receives the drug, another of which receives the placebo, and you compare 
the outcomes in order to make an inference about whether this, effect, um, this drug was effective. Notice the intense reliance on comparison to something else, another body of knowledge, or in this case, another group that has experienced a lot, all of the same, or you're attempting to incur all of the same other factors. Inference, even in science, requires a comparison. You also need to make a comparison in every known model of quantitative or applied statistics. You may be familiar, either passing with, uh, either, either just in general knowledge or as an expert with the concept of statistical significance. But if you're not, here's a really quick approach. Um, there is a type of statistics, which we call frequentist statistics, which is known most, um, most commonly for its range of tests that they call hypothesis tests. And hypothesis tests are a way of, of assessing the quality of evidence relative to a specific hypothesis. In this jargon of this field, they call that the null hypothesis. You make an assumption about what you think is probably the most uninteresting thing that could be true. You simulate what values might be reasonable if that, un that, th if that null or uninteresting hypothesis is true. Then you run an experiment and you compare your data. Again, compare your data to this null hypothesis. And if it is sufficiently deviating from what you expected in this uninteresting case, then you get to call your results significant. And that changes the type of inferences that you can make in this framework. Now, not a lot of, nowadays, frequentist statistics, not everyone's really in love with them, lots of problems. People are moving into this, concept, this other new type of statistics, Bayesian inference in statistics. Again, details are not that important other than the fundamental aspects of how Bayesian inference works is you have what they call a prior or a set of beliefs, what you currently believe to be true. You collect new evidence and then you update your set of beliefs to reflect that new evidence. No matter which way you roll, you start with a guess. You start with your default understanding of how things work. You need knowledge in order to get more knowledge. Data only informs once you already know something. It's frustrating. I wish that wasn't the case. Last, last push, just trying to prove to you that this really is fundamental and that you're not going to get around it and none of the new tech that's coming out is getting around this fundamental difference. We'll look to the, the philosophy of science. One of my favorite philosophers is Karl Popper. Uh, Karl Popper is most famous for the concept of falsifiability, the idea that a theory can never be proven true, it's only not yet false. Um, he's also not very pithy, as philosophers go, so I had to struggle really hard to pull out quotes um, from his work that would be even slightly meaningful out of context, but here's the best that I could do. The top quote, um, in his argument that data does not speak for himself, he says, the belief that we can start with pure observation alone without anything in the nature of theory is absurd. Now, that's not an argument, that's just a statement of opinion, but the best, the, the quickest summary I can say of his argument is the second quote. He argues that observation is always selective. It needs a chosen object, a definite task, an interest, a point of view, or a problem. So Popper takes this one level further than I'm trying to take it here in this talk. His argument is not just that you have to know something to learn something, but in fact, the act of choosing to make an observation, of choosing to collect data in and of itself, you have already made a bunch of assumptions about what you believe to be true. So it's not only that you have to know something, but the fact that you bothered to choose to make an observation means that you have already biased the outcome um, based on your current set of beliefs. That's a little too, f that's not wrong, but a little too far for where I'm going right now. Super interesting philosopher. Um, and this is one of those rare points of kind of agreement in philosophy, where even people like Thomas Kuhn, who is usually set up as like the antithesis to Karl Popper, kind basically agree on the fundamentals. In order to learn from data, you have to already know something. That was my whirlwind um, argument back into the practical side of this. So here's what I think about designing data products. Um, and hopefully, none of this is all that novel or new. First, you have to know your audience. 
and you cannot please everyone at the same time. You have to pick part of the market where your product will have a good fit. And once you pick the part of the market, you have to pick a focused problem that you're trying to solve. Because data can potentially inform many different original beliefs, it sometimes has this feeling as if there's so many different things my data can do, can't I just make it do it all at the same time? You can't. Getting more flexibility is just removing the information from your data. You actually have to go specific and make a comparison to a very specific set of beliefs to encode any information at all. And then, again, telling you what you already know, but just in the context of data, you have to make sure your problem has a sufficient market. And here's where I'm going to give you the biggest hint that I've learned in making uh, products that are successful and scalable, is there are not that many experts on any given subject. And they're probably never going to be satisfied with anything that you do. So maybe learn from them, but don't build for them. And listen to their criticisms of your product, but don't necessarily do what they say. Easier said than done. Um, most of my talk is on a product perspective today, so I added my one little piece of UX device, uh, advice not being a designer at all, which is when you display the data, you have to make an explicit comparison, and you should make that comparison as physically close to the raw data as you possibly can. And by that, I mean in the same graph, at the same time, right next to it, so there's no ambiguity about what sh it should be compared to. Going more practical, let's think about an actual dashboard. So I pulled these dashboards off random clip art on Google, and I don't know what any of them mean because I'm not an expert, but they do all exhibit the basic trends of how dashboards work, which is that I have no idea what I'm supposed to be looking at. I have no idea if things are working or they're not working, and I don't know how to interpret this at all. But they do all start with giant big numbers at the top, and this is because a lot of dashboarding softwares have this widget that they call big number or big metric. So let me just start with a big number and big metric and show you simple changes you can do to make your dashboard more informative and make a better product. A piece of data. 10 gigabytes per hour. What does this mean? Well, unlike when on the topic of big cats, I actually know a lot about processing data pipelines. So when I look at 10 gigabytes an hour, there's a lot of things that I can make guesses about. I can make a guess about the type of company you are. Because not a lot of companies, usually only tech companies, are processing in real time lots of data um, in a streaming pipeline. And because I know that, I probably can make some good guesses about what tech you used in your architecture and how many people you have running your team, and um, probably a little, some fairly good guesses about the nature and type of data. Um, for example, <laughs> this is probably not Netflix, because it's nowhere near enough data for a streaming video. So I know a lot, but that's because I'm an expert on this topic, and I want to build a dashboard for someone who is not an expert on this topic. What can I do? I can give them a comparison, something to compare the data to so that they are able to make an inference. This doesn't feel like rocket science. It's not, <laughs> it's not but it's actually very often overlooked. I can put my big metric next to a normal operating range, and now even non-experts can figure out that this is in the normal range of operation. So two things have happened here. One, I've made an explicit comparison to what I thought should be compared to as normal. And that allows people who are not experts to make an inference about whether things are generally OK. But the other thing I did is I restricted how many different inferences people can make from this data. I have picked a problem. And I have said, no, actually, I don't want you to start speculating on all these other things. This is what I put this data here for, and this is what I want you to know about this data, and this is what I want you to interpret from this data. 
I have taken the onus of knowing what's important off the person who is consuming the information. I also know why a lot of people don't do this, and it's very practical. And it's, this is an example that I talked about a little bit earlier, but I call it the expert tra uh, trap. And it's because you have experts uh, on your team, on your operations team, who are like squeaky wheels and who tell you, well, technically that's not the normal operating range and this stuff can get really messy and it might still be working even if it's in the normally, or if it's out of the normal operating range and it might still be broken even if it's in the normal operating range. And a lot of this is true. And in fact, experts know that almost any data processing pipeline or really businesses in general have this day and night cycle where they do more things during the day and less things during the night or if they're hugely global or multinational, maybe it's just shifting about which regions or which part of their pipelines are processing most data. And also if your company is growing, for example, how much you were processing yesterday, what was normal yesterday may not be normal tomorrow and that's a good thing because you want your company to be growing. And so you also you actually need this extremely complex definition of normal in order to make a comparison, in order to know what's truly normal. And your experts will tell you this, and they are right. That is a better definition of normal that will allow more precise inferences. But here's the secret. Um, oh, a side note, this is also what modern day cutting edge anomaly detection does, is define a very, very complex definition of normal for which to compare and define anomalies. So even machine learning is still just making comparisons. That's how we make inferences. Um, you shouldn't listen to your experts because your experts already know the answer. That's why they're complaining to you. They didn't need this dashboard to make that inference, and so they don't have a pain point. And the truth is that they were going to go look at the source to get this data anyways. If they saw something messed up about the, the processing on the pipeline, the first thing they're going to do is not look at the dashboard. They're going to go log in to whatever server they know causes the problem most of the time and see what's going on there. They have other ways of solving this problem. And since they are so close to having enough information to act, they also have a, you also have a lot of competition for your product. If you're thinking about building it and scaling it, Experts are going to find other ways to solve the problem. Maybe this isn't where you want to compete. And maybe what you really want to do is instead of making tiny, tiny increments for experts, make these huge jumps for the rest of your team by providing a good enough estimate, a good enough guess of what normal is so that they can be more informed. Because at least then, even an expert can look at a dashboard and say, things look pretty much OK they can at least make the most basic inference and that gets them to say, I don't have to, for example, call the on-call engineer um, or something like that. This is a second example um, on a totally different domain, just to, just to prove the point. Um, this is an example of a, a company's revenue um, plotted over the last five years with the target that they were trying to hit. Um, this is a good visualization because it shows the data, the actual revenue, and some reference point. This is what they were going for. This is the target. And so even non-experts can make the inference that this company is hitting or, meet or exceeding their target year after year after year. That is a super solid inference. But if you... Um, that's a super solid inference. Nothing wrong with it. But that doesn't mean you won't get quibbles. Um, you could take the same data and change your frame of reference. So instead of having how well is this company performing internally relative to their own targets and their own metrics, how well is this company performing relative to their next nearest competitor? And in this case, you have company A still with their linear growth curve, but while their, competi their competition is taking over most of the market. And this changes the story very dramatically. Or does it? Is the story changed or has your audience changed? If you are an investor and you're trying to make the decision, should I invest in this company, it depends on what type of investor you are. 
If you are a lifestyle investor who likes companies that have solid foundations and are making good progress, and you can get really good terms on this deal, you may not care that the competition is getting much, much bigger. You may have some idea of how this is differentiating. Or you could be one of the classic VCs that are looking for the huge 10x return, in which case this, this other graph changes the entire nature of your inference. And this just brings the point that instead of data being wrong, instead of inferences being wrong, it depends who you're talking to and it depends on their frame of reference for what they're trying to accomplish. You actually have to know who it is and what they're looking for in order to design an analysis. What you don't want to do is provide no information at all just so that you don't make anyone mad. Because this is just not helpful. I mean, it's not that there's no information here. You have some comparisons. You can show it growing over time. But you really have no idea, or no ability to assess the company's health um, relative to any of the standard metrics that people use to make these predictions. Meeting in the middle, trying to err on just, oh, you can plot whatever you want and make whatever inferences you want. We're just providing like, just the data. It's just the data. You're just going to make people frustrated. Um, hard learn lesson. Okay, getting to the end, but just a quick summary of the things I told you that you probably already knew, but are worth hearing again. Data does not speak for itself. Summary statistics fail to provide repeatable and scalable value because they only empower experts. Experts can use raw data Everyone else can't because we don't have the context in, in any arbitrary field. You can choose to empower non-experts to make great inferences by comparing data to the correct expert mental model explicitly. Give them the context they need to make the inference and you will empower them to do that. But when you do that, you are making a choice. You are making a choice to solve a specific problem in a specific way for a specific person. And you should own that, because that's also good product development um, philosophies. Find your niche, grow your niche, but crush the problem you started with in the first place. Just don't get distracted when people tell you, oh, you could do it this way. Oh, you could do it this way. Oh, give them this other context. Actually, if someone else would actually prefer to look at it this way, because you have to know who you're building for and listen to what they're asking for um, very specifically. And that's what I got. Any questions or arguments, you can send them my way. Thank you for taking the time uh, to give this discussion. I'm kind of curious, did you think about categorizing this other than experts versus non-experts? Like power users versus like non-users? The reason why I ask is simply, uh, having worked in the finance world, a lot of the, the experts are the data analysts, and they're essentially living through the data lake and presenting something to the non-expert C-level people to actually make actionable items. Mm -hmm. So I do think, um, so the question is, could you segment your market differently than experts and non-experts? Of course, and that's your frame of reference and which is your strategy for how you choose to segment it. Um, power, it doesn't change the nature. Power users still need to have the ability to get the right context. Um, simply because they're more proficient at using your tool doesn't like change the nature of how, you, how you're able to inform them. But it's certainly true that you can make a more sophisticated model and then make more sophisticated product strategies than, you know, no somethings, no nothings. It's just easier as a first pass. Can you expand on um, expert mental models and what you mean by that um, and kind of how do you find those things out, anything like that? Yeah, um, I wish there was a, so the, the question is, what do you mean by expert mental model? Um, the example I gave here was actual knowledge about big cats and their weights um, and how these things actually correlate and mean together. But it, I mean, the, the, the short and long of it is domain expertise, like actual knowledge. Um, so in science, you think about theories as being more or less strong based on how predictive they are of um, 
hypotheses or events that were otherwise hard to predict. So a strong mental model would be one that has, you know, historically done very good at presenting and predicting new behaviors and new things that were happening. And a weak one would be one that was not as good at that. Um, but yeah, it's basically domain expertise. Um, there's, it's about knowing what actually matters for the problem you're trying to solve, actually knowing cause and effect. So you mentioned a problem that we are trying to solve, but what if we don't know the problem yet? So we know there's non-experts in the field, but mm -hmm. we don't know how unsure they are about the space we are in. Let's say we know something about the space, right? but we don't know what they know. So how do we go about figuring out what is actually the gap between the non-experts and the reality? Um, how do you figure out uh, the difference between non-experts and experts. Um, you start with an initial guess, you collect data, and then you iterate on your hypothesis about what that is over time. And in the, the nature of your guess there is what do my users know and not know? Um, and so you have, you, in the same way that you iterate and you're expecting them to iterate on your product, you're gonna iterate on your model of um, what is my ideal target market? Um, so sort of a little bit circular, but it's the nature of, of figuring it out. I think of it very much uh, as hypothesis-driven testing on your market as well. When you talked about um, using a metric like the normal operating range, being you know like eight to 15 as a way to, uh, to uh, uh, contextualize the data, mm -hmm. um, I, th I think you made a comment about how when you're doing that, that metric also kind of um, it, it, it uh, you're kind of telling them how to look at the data as well. Like you're, you're setting like a lens for it. I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit more. Like I'm curious about, I see that it's, it's obviously very valuable, but I also wonder about are there times when we use like the, lo the wrong lens or the wrong, um, the wrong way of uh, tr contextualizing that data? Yeah. Um, choosing what your point of reference is this is actually a slide I took out, so I'll add it back in. Choosing what your point of reference is is the single most important design decision of any analysis. It is literally the only thing really that matters, um, and it is really hard. And it really, in, in the, the way that I think about it, um, statisticians tend to assess um, evidence on a continuous scale. Um, but there is a point at which you have to make a decision, and I always think of decisions as thresholds. And as soon as you make a decision, as soon as you make an action, you can now assess error rates. You can assess how right you were wrong or wrong at any given threshold. And then it becomes, did I set my boundary well enough that my errors and my, um, my false positives and false negatives are acceptable for the problem that I have? So it might be that then it's going to become a question of optimizing expected value. If you're, if you're operating on a system that is mission critical and if a single error could take down your entire business, you're going to error on the side of generating false positives and generating alerts that are not actually real alerts. Um, or if it's not, it's more of a balanced, you want people to look at it, you might consider certain types of alerts handled in different ways based on the strength of the evidence in support of them. Um, so yeah, that's the hard part, and that's how you get that more expert model as you, as you um, iterate over time. But certainly in a product development cycle, um, standard deviations are super good MVPs while you're trying to figure out, um, for this context of normal, while you're trying to figure out um, other unknowns like your, uh, pro your market and the people that you're trying to target. So, Super solid first guess while you have so, many other, so much other uncertainty in your development process. Thank you, that was an amazing talk. Um, really inspirational. Can you share your thoughts on situations where you as, a, um, as an analyst are an expert in statistics or some of the non-descriptive ways of showing data and you're showing it to a domain expert where they may not actually be an expert in the statistics. Um, so the, the question is essentially you have an analyst that's more technical than their audience. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is actually the part where you actually get to play with the design 
Um, so I'm, I'm very much a, a believer in the principle of least surprise um, for conveying information. So I, I know that there's problems with colorblindness, with red and, red and green, but I really think this idea of green is good, red is bad, is very like, fundamental to the way that you convey information. So in as much as you can rely on other types of shared knowledge that are non -statistic, like not statistical, um, you should rely on, on those to, to sort of create your story and craft your story. I, I don't like, um, I am a statistician by training, but I don't believe that data is like purely objective. It's really about framing it in a way that your audience makes sense to your audience um, so that you get the outcome you're trying to get. So um, that's not super helpful other than maybe start with some shared knowledge that you can agree on and build since there. I really like the example with the, the knock and sock, and this question is a little bit in the weeds. Um, usually they make management, and if clients pass by, really happy, but no one actually uses them, like you're kind of uh, uh, indicating. Do you have any specific examples where there are some metrics that are very useful to project onto the giant walls and large screens for knocks and socks? Yeah. Um, so this is a context-depending thing. Why would you want something on a giant wall? Um, if you would want it on a wall, if you want anyone to be able to action off of it, um, so something that anyone could make useful or anyone else knows how to action it. So if it's like a, there is a problem, someone should call this person and there's a known action, then having the dashboard sh show that action or like alert somehow that that, that action needs to be taken um, is a way of uh, conveying that information. Another way that I've seen dashboards used well, um, Oftentimes, when there's a, an outage, uh, the idea is that you could use giant dashboards and everyone could gather around and they could all look at the same thing. Um, because the concept of an outage is there was a time in which it was okay and there was a time when it is now not okay, a really interesting thing to do with dashboards is have the same information from two different points in time displayed on different dashboards. Again, setting up this comparison um, so that in real time, in moments of outages, you might be able to um, someone, everyone could be sitting there comparing to see what is the difference between these two states that might alert to the thing that's different between this past time and this current time. Um, but it sort of limits the scope. I would just build dashboards knowing that they're for getting the first 10 seconds of situational awareness and not any deep dives past that point. Um, and then you can display less data and then you can work on making that data um, the most useful to the most number of people so that it, it fits well on a wall. So. so this is a little bit of a complicated question, but I'll try and <laughs> phrase it the right way. So I work for a SaaS company, and we're currently having this issue where we built a whole bunch of dashboards, and we know that none of our users are looking at them. And I've been kind of pushing from the beginning to do a lot of stuff that you're talking about. We need to make them simple. We need to make them more targeted. But we... I'm not really seeing that kind of buy-in from a lot of the developers and a lot of the data scientists and people I work with. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, like, have you had that kind of experience before where you don't have that kind of buy-in from uh, other people at your organization and they kind of keep insisting, no, we need to make for the experts when your users really aren't experts? Um, yes. I mean, most of my experiences have been like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, what I what I what I would say, um, what I would say is that um, I think it's a mistake to think that dashboards have to be used a lot in order to be useful. Um, I think that the most important thing about a dashboard is that it can convey a lot of information. Or I, what dashboards I love the most convey a lot of information very quickly, and I just know that in given a certain set of a certain set of conditions, if I went and looked at them, they would have the information that I need to act. So a, a reasonable hypo product hypothesis is that people will not look at this dashboard often. Um, and I think that's great. I actually think the concept of analytical dashboards is a little far-fetched. Um, and dashboards are much more better suited to this sort of fast, did I get the information I need? Now I can make an, a decision. And so while I, I'm sympathetic and I don't have the answer to how to make everything work, um, I do think a thing to consider is whether um, you want your dashboard to be something that's actually used all the time or if you're actually designing it for that moment in time 
situa situational awareness. I think about this a lot when I think about Google Maps, which I think is a phenomenal user dashboard. Like, I don't go sit staring at it all the time unless I actually need directions, right? So I might use it a lot because I use directions a lot, but that's the nature of picking the right problem, um, not so much about, like, it, when I actually need the information, I can get it very, very fast. I'm curious what your ideas for how BI tools are lacking. Like, I got some examples. Um, you know, like a bar chart, you know, you could like add the average as one bar and then have the, um, the target as another, but you know, it wouldn't really, you kind of have to do a little work to make that kind of uh, serve your point about you know, keeping a reference. So I just wanted to see if you had ideas on like how the, where BI tools are going to kind of serve this like big theory you have. And by that, by BI tools, you mean like dashboarding tools in general? Yeah, like, like, you yeah. know, throw up the KPI widget and then, you know, put in the, you know, exact 10 gigabytes per hour and then put your threshold in. Yeah. Well, some, some tools that I think are severely underutilized on dashboards is annotations. Um, as far as shared context, language is one that many, many people share. And so if you can't convey it in uh, a graph, it is, it is okay to use words. Um, and it actually can, it actually can ex expand your audience very dramatically um, in some cases. So I think that that is an underutilized. Um, and, it, and I think it takes away from the sort of like techie feel of dashboards, but can also make them um, very useful. Um, but other than that, I mean, some of the ones that um, I've seen coming up are like, you know, simple dials that have some concept of um, uh, empty or full or, and so that, that relies, this is imagery that relies on some sort of shared context of what is good and bad. But you have to put a title on the graph and the title has to be interpreted, interpretable by someone who doesn't know the name of every machine in your architecture. Right, so you have to, like simple things like that can make a huge difference. And again, it's not about data, it's about context that you need to interpret the data. So the data is always there, but if you label it with a machine number, only experts are gonna be able to interpret that. And when you label it with something functional that someone could know who to call if this box is red, like if these boxes are red, call this person. If these boxes are red, call this person, then now you've designed a dashboard that is functional for a a more wider audience. So I'm not sure if that's helpful. I, I'm definitely thinking very operational in my examples because that's just my day to day, but it's not, um, not the only way to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. Can we give her another round of applause? So thank you all for coming. Uh, I also want to say thank you to our volunteers tonight, Michael, Lisa, Teresa, Roran, and Chensi. Uh, next month, as I mentioned earlier, we will be moving to General Assembly on Broadway. So next month, we'll, our event will be Data That Works, How to Build an Analytics Practice. We'll have Michelle Glazer, uh, who's built the analytics team at WW, formerly known as Weight Watchers. Uh, she'll share how she's worked with product and design to make data-driven decisions and how she helped to transform a 55-year-old company into a tech-enabled, data-rich powerhouse. So we hope to see you next month over at General Assembly. Uh, stick around for a little while longer, uh, meet somebody new, and we hope to see you next month. <laughs>